Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and I will be your host today. Today, I begin with the word legend. A legend. I refer not to this definition of the word in dictionary.com, quote, a non-historical or unverifiable story handed down by tradition from earlier times and popularly accepted as historical. Nor am I referring to this one from the Cambridge Dictionary, quote, a very old story or set of stories from ancient times or the stories, not always true, that people tell about a famous event or person. Hmm. These words from the free dictionary come closer to my musings with today's book in the spotlight. Quote, a person whose fame or notoriety makes him or her a combined source of true, exaggerated, and romanticized tales or exploits. A person whose fame or notoriety makes him or her a combined source of true, exaggerated, and romanticized tales or exploits. Let us hold on to that thought for a moment, please. <laughs> As with every year in history, the year 1871 had some remarkable happenings internationally and within our 48 states. The Great Chicago Fire kills an estimated 300 people and destroys over four square miles of buildings and the original Emancipation Proclamation. The National Rifle Association is first chartered in the state of New York. Jesse James and his gang rob the Obacock Bank in Corydon, Ohio for $45,000, 1871. U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant condemns the Ku Klux Klan Millions of birds fly over Western San Francisco, darkening the sky. The US income tax was repealed. Really? Now, more to the day's point. May 4, 1871, witnessed the first National Baseball League game the National Association of Baseball Players, Fort Wayne, two, Cleveland, zero. And on October 24, 1871, a man by the name of Louis Sokolexis was born on the Penobscot Indian Reservation across a narrow tributary of the Penobscot River 66 miles north of Camden in the famous wooden canoe making village of Old Town. Now, let me connect the dots. 26 years later, in 1897, Louis Sokolexis of the Penobscot Nation became a legend in U.S. Major League Baseball as baseball's first Indian. The title of today's book, In the Spotlight, written by Ed Rice. With that fame came almost equal portions of true, exaggerated, or romanticized tales and exploits. Could Sock, as he became to be known, 
have once literally stolen a 1-0 victory for his team by being walked and then swiping second, third, and home on three consecutive pitches? Hmm. Is there any proof that Sock Alexis was the model for main author Gilbert Pattern's fictional baseball hero, Frank Merriwell of Yale, while the Penobscot Indians starred in the main summer Knox County League? Hmm. Did his father, Francis, tribal governor of the Penobscots from 1895 to 1896, make a Herculean canoe trip down the Penobscot River, down the Atlantic Ocean to Washington, D.C., to find President Cleveland and get Cleveland's help to prevent his son from leaving the reservation to play baseball at Holy Cross College. Hmm. Did Sock Alexis at Holy Cross once make a lightning throw, a throw so far and accurate that two Harvard professors measured the distance and declared it a world's throwing record? Hmm. Could it have once could he have once stolen six bases in one game, running both for himself and an injured teammate? Hmm. Could he smash home runs so far against Brown University that these titanic blows smashed chapel and dormitory windows on campus? Did he once swim across a creek to make a catch? Could Sook Alexis's mere presence and the sensation it caused have inspired the change of the Cleveland Major League team's nickname from the Spiders, in place since 1889, to the Indians in 1897, a name that stayed with the team all the way up to the end of the 2021 season. Let's hear more from Ed Rice in his 2003 book, republished in 2019 with a new preface. Baseball's first Indian, the story of Penobscot legend, Louis Sock Alexis. But before exploring the story told, let's consider some facts about the author. Ed Rice, a newspaper man by profession, and a baseball fan by passionate hobby, Ed Rice has devoted nearly 25 years to the legend that was Louis Sock Alexis. This former daily newspaper reporter and weekly newspaper editor combined his love of journalism and baseball with his interest in Native Americans to write this vital biography. Born in Brookline, Massachusetts, he grew up in Bangor, a short 13 miles from the home of the Penobscot Nation on Indian Island. He has been an arts critic for the Portland Press Herald, Maine Sunday Telegram, the Maine Times, and Maine Public Broadcasting System's Maine Things Considered on radio. Rice has also taught journalism and communication studies at several main colleges. With the utmost of passion, Ed has dedicated untiring and uninterrupted hours to, quote, restoring proper recognition of Louis Sock Alexis first known Native American pro baseball player and help recover for him legacies that have been either lost or wrongfully stripped from him. 
quote, I remain heartbroken by how precious few individuals properly appreciate the historical figure of Louis Francis Sokolexis. He continues, as an historical personage far too long forgotten, he deserves appropriate recognition and hopefully this book will help in the battle to correct certain points in the narrative to his history. Long discredited by many, both inside and outside of his home state of Maine. On October 24, 2013, the 142nd anniversary of Louis Sock Alexis's birth in 1871, author Ed Rice donated to the Maine State Library and Museum all of the newspaper and magazine clippings photographs and artifacts from more than one quarter of a century of research on Louis Sock Alexis. Research used in his biographies of the great Penobscot Indian athlete. Since Lewis died on December 24, 1913, it was also exactly two months past the 100th anniversary of his death when Ed's contribution was made. Baseball's First Indian. To quote from the book's promotional material, quote, Ed Rice's fascinating study of the life of Lewis Sock Alexis is filled with game by game action and leavened by the flamboyant and colorful stories of 19th century sports writers who frequently invented what the truth would not supply. Hmm. Baseball's first Indian explores the brilliant but troubled and all too brief major league career of the Deerfoot of the Diamond, as he was respectively called by teammates and sports writers alike. The book follows the remarkable baseball player's rise to the majors, his fall to the minor leagues of New England, and his final return to Maine, where he continued to coach baseball and work as an empire, an umpire. In the words of writer William David Barry of the Maine Sunday Telegram, quote, at last we have a solid, reliable account of one of Maine's most fascinating sports figures. In my humble opinion, I cannot claim to be an avid baseball fan, but I can claim to have spent 16 of my formative years growing up in Old Town, Maine, cherishing friendships with several schoolmates from the Penobscot Nation. I also had the privilege of standing in front of the Indian Island Gravesite Memorial to Louis Sock Alexis, unveiled in 1934 and inscribed with these words, quote, in memory of Louis Sock Alexis, whose athletic achievements while at Holy Cross College and later with the Cleveland Major League Baseball team won for him national fame. The Sock Alexis name disappeared from Indian Island on June 16, 1987, when the great baseball player's nephew and namesake, Louis J. Sock Alexis, died at age 72. But the memory of the name and the man live on in the annals of the great American sport of baseball, a Maine sports legend. Today, to give you a sampling from this book, I'm going to read in a somewhat reverse order. 
in this way is what I mean. We're going to start with a chapter called The Early Years, just to set the stage, of course, for the early years of Lewis Sokolexis. I'm going to then go, strangely enough, to a late chapter in the book called The Dreamer, which is a beautiful fictional tribute to Sokolexis. I'm skipping the entire center of the book. Ed Rice writes an incredible book, play by play, I must say, which I feared might uh, be a little too in-depth. So I'm going to go from the beginning to the end, and then I'm going to go back to the beginning to his introduction. Ed Rice, as I said, has spent 25 years uh, trying very uh, vigorously to bring to the memory and the history of Louis Sokolexis the recognition he deserves. And he makes a very strong point for that in the introduction. Um, so I'm going to actually put that after the story of Lewis. And then if time permits, I have an interesting article which Ed Rice wrote with a reporter of the Bangor Daily News in 2022. Uh, which brings us up to date a bit. So I'm going to hope to bring in all four sections of this story and um, fill in enough of the blanks to lure you into reading the entire book. So let me begin, if I may, with the early years, which is technically the first chapter of the book, and then we shall go from there. Louis Francis Sokolexis was born on Indian Island, Maine on October 24, 1871, the same year as the inaugural season of organized baseball in America. The reservation of the Penobscot Indian Nation that settled in central Maine, Indian Island is located just across the Penobscot River from the small community of Old Town and some 13 miles north of what was once the booming, lumbering capital of the world, Bangor, Maine. Born into the Bear Clan, Lewis was the great nephew of Chief Toma Thomas Sokolexis, who was born in 1813 and died in 1870. In 1832, Tomo is the chief of the tribe, and the Penobscots attempted to name him chief for life. The Maine legislature, however, told the tribe that such an action was illegal. The Penobscots switched to a tribal governorship in 1867. Joseph Atian, who was the last chief of the tribe, was elected its first tribal governor. Lewis's great uncle, Thomas Sokolectus, returned to leadership as the tribal governor in 1868 and served one year. Lewis's father, Francis P. O. Sokolexis, was born in about 1841 and served as tribal governor from 1895 to 1896. Married Francis Sokobason, also born in 1841. The couple's first child was Lewis. Apparently, several later siblings died in infancy. Lewis had one surviving sister, Alice, who was six years younger. She married Thomas Pennewait, had two daughters, and died in 1928. The Penobscots, members of the Wabanaki Alliance, which included the Maliseet, Micmac, and Passamaquoddy nations, had been proud and victorious warriors in an earlier day, soundly defeating the Iroquois, much feared. In fact, they were, in James Fenimore Cooper's fictional leather stocking tales, known as the fighters of the Six Nations, the Iroquois were reportedly the reigning power from the Gulf of St. Lawrence to the Mississippi River, but after suffering heavy losses in their encounters with the Penobscots, they kept a respectful distance from the region now known as Maine. Growing up on the small island reservation, Soki, as he was called then, 
attended the local school, which was what run by Jesuit priests, as well as the old village chapel on Sundays, which still stands. As a young boy on the island, he topped all his mates, demonstrating an exceptional blend of power and speed in such childhood games as running, jumping, and swimming. In high school, he excelled in football, track, and baseball. Some Penobscot sources claim that Lewis was the first person from Indian Island to graduate from high school, but there are no official records. Salk Alexis was discovered by a priest who showed inspired scouting judgment and encouraged the Indian youth to continue both his education and ball playing. This paralleled the discovery of baseball's greatest legend, Babe Ruth. Ruth left St. Mary's in Baltimore, Maryland for a professional career. After attending the small school on the island and the high school in Old Town, my alma mater, Silk Alexis left for St. Mary's School in Van Buren at the very northern tip of Maine to continue his education and perhaps polish his baseball skills. It was the first of several significant steps under a long ladder the Penobscot youth would climb before reaching the professional ranks. One of the earliest summer town teams for which Lewis Sok Alexis played might have been the one on Squirrel Island, just off the coast of Booth Bay Island. Rob White, editor of the Squirrel Island Squid newspaper, wrote in July of 1994 that baseball games were played on the island as early as 1876. And in 1888, the editor of that issue of the Squid announced with great pride that, quote, one of the greatest attractions here this summer will be baseball. The island will have a nine made up of well-known players. The island team faced rivals from Rockland, Bath, Richmond, Bodenham, and Ocean Point. Four days later, the newspaper announced, quote, Louis Sok Alexis, who has recently arrived at Squirrel from his home in Old Town, is about 15 years of age, actually in the summer of 1888, Sok would have been 16, and is one of the most powerful pitchers the island has seen for years. He has all the curves. Perhaps the mystery of when and where Louis Sok Alexis hurled those alleged three no-hitters has a possible solution here. According to player Walter Emerson, reporting in the Lewiston Journal, the island had an almost unbeatable team in the late 1880s for two years. Emerson, the team's first baseman, was a member of championship team at Colby College in the early 1880s, said the team consisted of, quote, catcher, Lewis Sok Alexis, an Old Town Indian who afterwards became famous as a big league player in the outfield of the Cleveland team, and second base, Joe Sok Alexis, another Old Town Indian player, and Lewis's cousin. The Squid also talked about some notable female players, including one named Harriet Holden, who was pitching, quote, in shoots and drops to catcher Lewis Sock Alexis, who retired after the seventh inning, somewhat the worst for wear. While several players were credited with parking at least one ball onto the library steps outside the field's dimensions, Rob White commented in a letter to the odd editor that an island veteran showed him areas where Lewis, quote, had hit balls beyond the library and to the more distant tennis courts. After two semesters at St. Mary's, he invertedly auditioned for the next rung while playing a game in Orono against a team from Holton. The Holton Club was made up mostly of young men attending Ricker Classical Institute in that northern Maine town. The club was coached by a Professor L.W. Felch, a physical education director at the school. So impressive was Sok Alexis's performance that following the game, 
Felch and many of the Holton players gathered around him, urging the talented athlete to come to Ricker to play during summers for the Holton team. An added inducement was that the Holton players were paid. Sock Alexis liked the arrangement, and in 1890, he entered the school and joined the team, making his home with a family in Holton. A puzzling aspect of the early Sock Alexis story emerges here. That he was able to maintain his amateur status, allowing him to play college baseball, while accepting pay for playing in several prominent summer leagues over the next several years. A number of college players used fake names and played for pay in leagues both in Maine and around New England. Yet Sock Alexis, who was notable both for his race and his stellar play, always played under his own name. And in any case, no form of deceit would have been likely to protect his identity. The Holton Town team was a member of the Maine New Hampshire League. Sock Alexis joined as a picture, and on his first season, the team won 26 of 28 games and captured the league title. Olin B. Rideout was Holton's first baseman. His brother Percy was the catcher. He once recounted how a disenchanted teammate, pitcher Horace Newentham, had said that he would go downstate and pick up college players and bring them back to Holton to beat us. He got the players all right, but they didn't beat us. Sock Alexis, of course, was what made the difference. But he had to outwit the Cajun Newenham. Wit Rideout recalled how the hurler knew just how to pitch to each of us, but would not throw a strike to Sock. <laughs> Avoiding any possible damage Sock Alexis might do on his own, Newenham walked him on his first three appearances at the plate and then successfully retired the other Holton batters. As Sock Alexis prepared for his fourth at bat, Rideout remembered the slugger determinedly telling his teammates, let him pass me again and I will score. Sock Alexis was as good as his word. Newenham again deliberately walked him. Sock Alexis successfully stole second, third, and home to score. Rideout reminisced, he would run like a deer and then slide the remaining distance. On his run from third to home, he knocked the catcher flying and also the ball. We won the game, 1-0. As extraordinary as they were, Sok Alexis's speed and batting prowess never quite reached the legendary descriptions prompted by displays of his throwing arm. Even when Sock Alexis was a high school youth, the strength of that right arm brought many challenges and provided many exhibitions. Purportedly, Sock Alexis could throw a baseball more than 600 feet from Indian Island across the Penobscot River to his father, waiting to make the catch on the Old Town side. At fair time in nearby Bangor, according to first cousin Henry Mitchell, Salk Alexis would throw a baseball over the length of the grandstand and over the top of the towering flagpole at the fairgrounds. Or he would amuse patrons by having an easy game of catch across the width of the racetrack oval with his father. All, of course, throws of prodigious length. Some of the stories still occasionally printed are clearly out of line with reality, such as the tales of Sock Alexis batting or throwing a baseball the length or width of several miles long Indian Island. Arthur Salisbury, visiting Indian Island in 1982, related a throwing tale that even one of Sock Alexis's kinsmen could not swallow. Salisbury interviewed the then 88-year-old host of the tribe's historical society office, a Miss Violet, who told him that Sock Alexis 
was reputed to have thrown a ball from Oak Hall on Indian Island that hit the smokestack of the Jordan lumber mill. Miss Violet thought Louis might have ranked with Babe Ruth if he hadn't have been a drinker, but doubted he threw a ball from Oak Hill to the lumber company because it's a distance of 4,000 feet. <laughs> Still a great many sources by self-professed eyewitnesses about Superman-like throws endure. At Maine's nationally famous Poland Spring Resort, reportedly but on a dollar bet, Sock Alexis is said to have successfully thrown a ball over the tower of Hiram Rickham's hotel. Olin Wideout, too, recalled that Sock performed many feats with a baseball, such as standing on the home plate of the Ricker grounds in Holton and throwing the ball out of the field. Over two rows of houses across Haywood Street, where we lived, so my brother could catch the ball in our yard. Another summertime team for which Lewis played was the Hutchins Sarsaparilla of Augusta. According to Robert E. Foy of Sydney, Maine, he and Joe Sock Alexis were members of the 1893 club that also featured Foy's grandfather, Orville Brown, the club's first baseman. A photograph of the team sent to the author by Foy, Foy shows a youthful Sock sprawled on the ground in front of the couple of rows of teammates holding what appears to be a catcher's mitt. On the back of the portrait, Louis Sock Alexis is again identified as a team catcher, and his cousin, Joe Sock Alexis, is seated right behind him in the first row and is listed as the club's second baseman. After playing at Holton for two summers, Sock Alexis first played with a stellar town team representing the Poland Spring House in 1894, and then played that same summer for the Warren team in Maine's Knox County League, a popular coastal league featuring town teams from Rockland, Camden, and Warren. Mike Doc Powers, a collegiate star with Holy Cross, had done the catching for both the Poland Spring and Warren clubs, and what he saw of Soak Alexis impressed him greatly. <clears throat> Excuse me. In this league, populated largely by talented college players, young Sok Alexis's play first became the stuff of storybook legend. For it was in the Knox County League that he was observed by Gilbert Patton, the manager of the Camden team, who went on to pen a series of famous, very famous baseball stories for young boys. Indeed, Sock Alexis is considered by several reputable sources as the real-life role model for one of the most famous of fictional baseball players, superhero Frank Merriwell. Patton was born in Corinna, just outside Bangor, in 1866 and wrote under the pseudonym of Bert L. Standish. He began writing his sporting yarns about the fiction, fictitious Merriwell of Yale in 1896 paralleling perfectly the zenith of Sokolaxis's Holy Cross exploits and his meteoric rise to professional baseball. Patton wrote The Adventures of Frank and Brother Dick Merriwell for 18 years. The stories were published in Tip Top Weekly, a magazine for boys that flourished before World War I. According to the Maine History Gallery, Patton's life work sold more than 125 million copies. His much beloved Merriwell Adventures delighted readers for decades, telling of the last minute heroics of a genial, well meaning athlete with a knack for doing everything imaginable right. Baseball historian Harry Grayson in his 1944 tome, They Played the Game, a book of thumbnail sketches describing more than 50 of baseball's greatest players to that date, specifically made the link, noting that Patton was managing one of the clubs in this main league at the time. Sock Alexis was routinely winning games single-handedly in the summer circuit. Grayson wrote, 
While playing with the college men in the Knox County League in Maine, Sock Alexis inspired the manager of one of the clubs to create the immortal Frank Merriwell under the pen name of Bert L. Standish. Powers was also a powerful captain at Holy Cross College and following the summer league season in 1894, he persuaded Sock Alexis to come with him to Worcester, Massachusetts to play with his college team. A legendary player inspires stories of legendary feats, some less plausible than others. Consider this one. Sock Alexis's father said to enjoy long range games of catch with his son was reportedly angered when Lewis became so engrossed in the sport of the white man that he threatened to leave the tribe. So upset was the father that he embarked upon a Herculean canoe journey down the Penobscot River to the sea and along the Atlantic coast until he came to Washington, D.C. There he hoped to visit President Grover Cleveland and to procure the papers that would allow the Penobscots to forsake their tribal governorship and return to being governed by a chief. He would thus be able to make his waywardly heading son, Lewis, chief of the Penobscot nation and circumvent any notions of his leaving the area to play baseball. According to writer Frederick John, this was the last desperate move by the elder Sokolexis to bind his son to the tribe, to make the call of the woods stronger than the call of the diamond. When the father returned from his long canoe trip, he found that his son had already departed. Writer Dick O'Connell also offered a version of the story, a tale that surfaced in several publications after the turn of the century, again at the time of Sock Alexis's death in 1913, and still again at the time of a rededication of his grave site in 1934. O'Donnell's detailed story went this way. On a chilly June morning at sunrise, Francis Sock Alexis departed, determined to end his son's quote, fascination for a child's game played with sticks and balls. He built a tiny birch bark canoe, approximately six feet in length. This is legend, me thinks. It took four days to travel 90 miles down the Penobscot River to the Atlantic Ocean. His progress was slowed because of dangerous rapids, and often he was required to leave the water and carry the canoe over land. Then came the Atlantic Ocean. The tribal leader quickly discovered it was safer out on the lonely ocean away from the shore. On Sock Alexis's first day on the ocean, tidal waters kept pulling the canoe toward shore where dangerous rocks waited. He paddled farther away from land and every day just before twilight, the Penobscot would head back to the shore. Once there, he checked the underside of his canoe and repaired any damage caused by salt water eating away at the bottom of the little wooden crap. Then he cooked the food he had available and spent the night on the beach. He was able to do some fishing while on the ocean. Finally, the Penobscot Indian leader arrived at Buzzards Bay on Cape Cod, where President Cleveland has a summer home. During the middle of July, that was, his hopes, O'Donnell confirmed, quote, were smashed when he went to Gray Gables, where the president spent his summer. Salk Alexis was told that President Cleveland had returned to Washington, D.C. Three days later, after repairing his canoe and buying supplies, the undaunted elder Salk Alexis was back on the open seas again, bound for Washington, the tribal leader did not reach the nation's first city until the middle of August. His canoe trip had covered 700 miles and had taken almost two months. Alas, there was more unhappiness for him when he knocked on the front door of the White House. President Cleveland was in the South on political business. The canoe paddler was obviously sick of the Atlantic, but he was not the type of person he was so easily defeated. 
he decided to rest for a few days and then head for Florida, <laughs> where Cleveland was scheduled to be two weeks later. By then, Sokolexis's epic sea journey in a canoe had been given a great deal of space in the press. Members of the main congressional delegation arranged lodging for him and made certain that his name was at the top of Cleveland's appointment list when the latter returned to Washington. They also chipped in and bought him a return train ticket back home, shipping his canoe to the reservation. Early in September, the great day arrived. Quote, the chief dressed in his final tribal, uh, finest tribal outfit and wearing a magnificent feathered headpiece, went to visit the president of the United States. Again, O'Donnell gives us the purported conversation. Mr. President, it is not right for my son to spend his time playing this child's game, said Sok Alexis. He will not listen to me, but if you speak, he will obey you. O'Donnell then interjects a curious thought. Even if deep down in his heart, Cleveland had been willing to help his, the father, his political wisdom would have overruled him. After all, baseball was the national pastime. The president reported, I am sorry, chief, but I am unable to help you. I do not have the authority to order your son not to play baseball. Even if I did, it would be wrong of me to issue such an order. O'Donnell's account concludes, the two leaders spent a friendly hour together discussing many subjects, including life on an Indian reservation. Perhaps others might have been cheered by such a happy visit with the leader of the nation, not Chief Sok Alexis. He was broken hearted. The president had been unwilling to help him. His son, Lewis, was free to play baseball. It is not possible to verify that such a trip or meeting with the president Cleveland took place, yet the story should not be dismissed entirely as myth. To do so is to think purely with a white man's sensibilities. The Penobscots, then and now, celebrate a long tradition as runners and canoeists and make trips of marathon proportions. Today, these trips include teams of Penobscots traveling to the far reaches of North America for weeks long canoeing trips in wilderness areas and the sacred 100 mile run from the reservation on the Penobscot River outside Old Town up to Mount Katahdin, underwritten annually undertaken annually in late August. Now, let me skip ahead a bit to later, and then I'll fill you in with the introduction. This is called The Dreamer, and it's a late chapter in the book. Uh, long after the topsy-turvy career of Lewis Sock Alexis, uh, and he is back on Indian Island at this point. The following story is written by Timothy Hayes Murnane for the May 1908 inaugural issue of the monthly publication, Baseball Magazine. Murnane, a native New Englander born in Naukatuck, Connecticut, was a big league player who became a manager and then in Boston Daily Globe sports editor. He played big league baseball for Boston and Providence from 1876 to 78, and for Boston again in 1884, playing a total of 229 games in four years as a first baseman outfielder. In 1899, Mernane organized and was the first president of the Connecticut League, where he would have seen Sock Alexis play. Murnane was still sports editor of the Boston Daily Globe when he died in 1917 at age 64. This fictional tribute to Sock Alexis, unabashedly respectful and spiritual, makes compelling mention of his unparalleled ball playing skills and his fatal weakness. The reference to Sok Alexis's brief return to glory may well be based on the Penobscot's success at Waterbury 
in Murnane's Connecticut League in 1899. And it is possible Murnane came up to Indian Island at a la later time to lure Sokalexis back into playing, it was rumored, as late as 1909 that Sokalexis was going to make a comeback in the Connecticut or New England leagues. Note the suggestion of an epic canoe trip for Sokalexis to make to return home. It sounds something like a legendary trip that some sources credited his father Francis with making up to try to bring his son from playing baseball. Here's the story. The night was crisp and cold, and the stars sparkled in a clear, dark blue sky high over the headwaters of the Penobscot. The playing of a dying flame from a few loose embers across small window panes gave warning that the little cottage was inhabited, and the stranger approached cautiously across a thin carpet of new fallen snow. A sharp rap at the door brought the response, come in, and the big noise pushed back the door with a hello, neighbor. There was no answer from the man who sat on a low bench close to the fire with a crutch at his side. Approaching, the stranger asked, isn't this my old friend Battle Axe? The name caused the invalid to straighten up and open his eyes. Then, throwing a few sticks of wood on the fire, he was soon able to recognize the features of his caller. Are you glad to see me, Axe? Indeed I am, but I'm all done up with the rheumatism. I came down to see if you'd go out next spring and play ball for me. Oh, 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 I would like to, but I don't think I will ever play another game. Yes, I played several years in the National League and was considered one of the great players. I can almost hear the ringing applause as I hit the ball on the center or when I made a long, accurate throw. But my popularity was my undoing. I dallied with the red water. It was come and go with me, and I found it difficult to keep away from the merry-go-round of civilization. And yes, I was a favorite with the public, but weakened. The pace was too fast for a boy developed by nature. But I believe if I had one more chance, I could win the battle against myself. Say, Axe, I'll take a chance. Take care of yourself and see you in the spring. Come and join us. With the spring came a message from the Indian saying, I will come, but with a weak ankle. The answer went back. Come on, I will plow up center fields so that the going will be easy. With renewed spirits, the Indian came and made good, was the sensation of the day, and once more became the idol of the fans. But soon, the red water commenced to show its work, and Battle Axe found himself in the same old condition, broke. He went to his friend, the big noise, and said, kind master, I find myself short on change and would like to return to my people under the sparkling stars of the upper Penobscot. The big noise smiled. He was happy, for an idea struck him full on the brain, and he spoke slowly but with full knowledge that the Indian was a weak one with the paddle. Battle axe, he said. Get a birch canoe. Follow the coast after you leave the Merrimack until you come to the Bay of Penobscot then hug the shore until you find the river. Then with the help of the great spirit, you will have nothing to fear until you hit Bangor and have to shoot the falls. The return of the great Indian to the old town 
was never headlined in the daily pages. And the stars once more twinkle high over the little cottage. The snow will never be broken again by a baseball manager looking for someone for a headliner. For Battle Axe has added other troubles to his rheumatism and sits the long evenings through, gazing into the blazing logs until the colors of the rainbow seem to reflect on angels' wings and the wild hurrahs of the howling fans awake the once great ball player to real facts of what might have been. And in my few remaining moments, I want to go back to the introduction after hearing all that you have about Lewis Sock Alexis, you now will find what the burning determination of today's author, Ed Rice, has focused on for 25 years. Um, so this is the introduction that he wrote to the original book. He has added a preface to the paperback edition, uh, which came out in 2019, 2019, yes. But this is the original introduction. Make sure I'm telling the truth. Yes, indeed. So hear this. The Abenaki Adonis, dear foot of the diamond, the red Romeo, these images suggest an Indian hero as powerful and fleet as he is handsome and bigger than life. Adonis and Romeo may need no introduction, but Deerfoot is probably Lewis Bennett, 1830 to 1897, of the Cattaraugus Reservation in New York, who is considered the premier distance runner of the 19th century. Penobscot tribesman Lewis Sok Alexis began his baseball career as the sort of arresting figure whose daily achievements were described in terms of hyperbole, but who remains an enigmatic figure to this day. Of such stuff, legends are made. It is clear to me that Sok Alexis is entitled to yet another title, one wrongly stripped from him. This book's title is an attempt to reassert the place of Lewis Sok Alexis as the first Indian baseball player. More than 18 years of research have reinforced my belief that this designation was unfairly taken from Lewis Sok Alexis and given instead to James Madison Toy, who has been the individual most frequently identified as the first Native American to play Major League Baseball. The claim that Toy was the first Native American to play Major League Baseball appears to have originated in 1962, when historian Lee Allen of the Baseball Hall of Fame bestowed this distinction on Toy. Unfortunately, no reference material of any type accompanied Allen's declaration, and close scrutiny of the claim reveals it to be based on word-of-mouth tales handed down from direct descendants. The historical toy played baseball rather uneventfully during the two seasons of 1887 and 1890. Even if documentation could be found to prove that James Madison Toy possessed Indian blood, where uh, the title that would most accurately describe him would be the first man with a Native American background to play Major League Baseball. Toy's impressive handlebar mustache and a Caucasian set of features made it very doubtful that contemporary baseball players, fans, and sports writers knew that he possessed Indian blood. If indeed he did. Louis Sok Alexis, on the other hand, was clearly recognized as an Indian by all of his contemporaries and was accordingly both heckled and acclaimed throughout his debut season with Cleveland in 1897. It is he 
who deserves recognition for being the first Native American to play Major League Baseball. Louis Sokalexis also deserves to be remembered as one of the greatest collegiate baseball players of all times, and as a charter member of the College of the Holy Cross's Sports Hall of Fame, created in 1956 in Worcester, Massachusetts. Furthermore, the very participation of Louis Sokalexis as a member of the Cleveland team in 1897 inspired the nickname that the baseball franchise holds today. Remember, the first publication of the book was 2003, so that did change in 2021. That Louis Sokalexis has lies buried in relative obscurity on Indian Island, Maine, beneath a monument sculpted and scripted in a manner reminiscent of the plaques honoring the legendary greats at the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, is one irony and a story replete with them. His Greek sounding name carries a kind of irony as well. Sokalexis's athletic accomplishments were heralded with the fanfare associated with epic heroes. Like many heroes, Sokalexis experienced dramatic triumphs, widespread adulation, and finally a wrenching fall from grace, prompted in his case by an addiction to alcohol. Ultimately, he failed to achieve the greatness that his peers and sport writers of the time attributed to him. At his best, Sok Alexis wore the mantle of hero so easily that it seems only natural that he would ser have served as the model for one of the most famous of fictional baseball heroes, slugger Frank Merriwell, Maine-born novelist Gilbert Pattern of Corinth, writing under the pseudonym of Bert L. Standish, began producing his sporting yarns about Merriwell of Yale in 1896, paralleling perfectly Sok Alexis's spectacular exploits at the College of the Holy Cross and his meteoric rise, rise to professional baseball. Patton had been a manager on the opposing team when Sok Alexis played a summer baseball league in 1895. It is unfortunate that Louis Sok Alexis, the nephew of a Penobscot chief, was not carved from tem timber nearly so durable as Frank Merriwell. Yet at the height of Sok Alexis's career, comments such as the following made by Huey Jennings were typical. Quote, Louis Sok Alexis had the most brilliant career of any man who ever played the game. At no time has a player crowded so many remarkable accomplishments into such a short period of time as Sok Alexis. He should have been the greatest player of all times, greater than Cobb, Wagner, LeJoy, Hornsby, and any of the other men who made history for the game. John McCaw, McGraw, one of baseball's most respected managers, said, if Sock had stayed up for five years, he could well have been better than Cobb, Wagner, or Ruth. Considering Sock Alexis's awe-inspiring collegiate exploits and his status as the man who inspired the name of a major league baseball team, Cleveland was the only professional baseball team ever nicknamed for an individual. Louis Sok Alexis deserves lasting fame. Unfortunately, even in Maine, the unique distinction that Sok Alexis achieved has most often either gone unnoticed or even been disputed. I hope this book clarifies the record of Louis Sok Alexis, explains something of his life, and helps him circle the bases and comes home in a manner appropriate to a truly gifted athlete, one who might have been one of the greatest stars in the baseball firmament. Those, of course, are the words of author Ed Rice in 2003, um, and such determination and such passion 
to return to Lewis Sock Alexis, the honors that he, Mr. Rice, feels he deserves. It's a great book, especially if you're a baseball fan, the play-by-plays of, of the Cleveland Indians are in here, uh, and lots of lore, lots of history, uh, lots of legend, some true, some not. Anyway, I thought the book inspiring, really, especially, of course, my connection to Old Town and Indian Island. So I suggest you read it if you're at all a sports fan, but more so just because of the unexpected. <laughs> the unexpected. The small boy from Indian Island, Maine, becomes a major league player. <laughs> it's a great story, period. Thank you very much for listening today. I, I hope you enjoyed the story, even if you're not an avid baseball player, as am I not. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about next week's book, if I may, in hopes of bringing you into the month of December with the first of our five books for December. There are five Fridays in December. And we shall start by a famous name, a famous man, a wonderful character, writer of children's books, particularly Rudyard Kipling, Rudyard Clip Kipling. Not a children's book, uh, but a book called The Light That Failed. It begins with Mr. Kipling's quote, actually. We have 40 million reasons for failure, but not a single excuse. Sounds like Kipling, doesn't it? The Light That Failed is a novel by the Nobel Prize winning English author Rudyard Kipling that was first published in Lippincott's Monthly Magazine, dated January 1891. Most of the novel is set in London, but many important events throughout the story occur in Sudan and in Port Said. It is Kipling's first novel, written when he was 26 years old, and his semi-autobiographical, based upon his own unrequited love, for Florence Gerard. Though it was poorly received by critics, the novel has managed to remain in print for over a century. It was also adapted into a play, two silent films, as well as a drama film. So I hope you'll join me. A great name in world literature, Rudyard Kipling, uh, and his first book at age 26. Let's see how he was writing at such a young age. I think you'll enjoy it, actually. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching today and uh, for listening to the story of Louis Sock Alexis from Indian Island, Maine. If you enjoyed the video, I hope you'll press the magic button, the up thumb, thumbs up, <laughs> and also consider perhaps sharing it maybe with a baseball fan you happen to know. Also, please feel free to leave a comment either about the story, anything I may have gotten wrong, <laughs> anything that you may know about uh, the legend, Lewis Sock Alexis, or a book that you particularly like, it has nothing to do with baseball, your favorite book. Be happy to consider that for the future. Uh, and also, please, I encourage you to subscribe uh, to the Camden Public Library's program's YouTube channel, to stay on top of all of the amazing uh, content of their programming. I am proud to say that we still remain uh, number one in the state of Maine as the library with the most subscribers to a program YouTube channel, even bigger than the bigger cities. So please join us by subscribing. Does it take anything? Does it cause any money so please join us in a Christmas gift to ourselves by remaining number one through the season <laughs> thank you again enjoy the rest of November if you're celebrating and I'll, uh, I'll help you step into December with next week's book by Rudyard Kipling do take care of yourself in the topsy-turvy weather outside snow is eventually going to be with us and do take a few moments to watch the remainder of the falling leaves. Take care of yourself. Goodbye.